Hello, and I hope all is well for you today. My name is Gershley Karen Pierre, and I'm pro marriage, pro the nuclear family. I want to make this disclaimer. I agree with the sentiment innately that black lives matter. I'm pro-black, so I would believe in the sanctity of our lives. I believe in black unity, empowerment, community, rebuilding, restoration, and healing. These are virtues that I think are meaningful to our world. So if I'm going to be pro our lives, of course I'm going to be pro the sanctity within our lives. But that's the point. I am pro our lives, but anything that's against it on a qualitative scale, I don't see it as pro us. The sentiment Black Lives Matter is meaningful. We need to be affirmed as a people. But the organization is what I'm going to draw a line against because, and this is sad, why? Why the irony? Why is it that you can't even appreciate an organization that you would think is for you and then stuff like this comes out that's very controversial? It makes you lose your respect. It makes the idea of being pro-us seem like it's a joke, when really it should be a lifestyle that we all are part of. But look at these guiding principles and tell me why I would agree with this nonsense. It appears that the organization wanted to distance themselves from this rhetoric, which is why they've removed on the official site, these principles. But thankfully, there are organizations and websites that have documented this, so it's known that this was actually said. They can't deny it. Likewise, those values are still being perpetuated by the DC branch of Black Lives Matter, and that's where you can actually find those 13 principles. I have to disagree when they say some of these points. Let's look at the points, by the way. There are 13. Restorative justice, empathy, loving engagement, diversity, globalism, queer, trans, affirming, collective value, intergenerational, black families and villages, and apologetically black, black women. Okay, so 13 points. And when you look at the title of these points, it may make you think that it's ideal until you read the description, and that's where I'm thrown off. Let's go to point 11. And it says Black Villages. We are committed to disrupting the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and, quote, villages that collectively care for one another, and especially our children to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. Why? I have to ask, why are you committed to disrupting the Western prescribed nuclear family structure? What did the Western prescribed nuclear family structure do to Black Lives Matter that it wants to delete it? Why would you disrupt a family? That's a literal definition of a home wrecker. So you're telling me Black Lives Matter, you're a home wrecker? Do you know what else is also a home wrecker? The broken homes. Broken homes wreck homes. Broken homes wreck communities. With criminality. With dysfunction. But you're saying that you want to disrupt? What can you disrupt? In the black collective, there are low marriage rates, not high. So you know what needs to be disrupted? The brokenness, not inclining us to more brokenness. You know what also is disruptive? The black collective. Because of our low marriage rates and our general chaos. So I don't even like this word disrupting as if we are ordered. And if we were ordered, why would you disrupt us? And if we were ordered, what would make you think it's okay to commit to our disruption of order? You see, we're not already ordered. It's not something to rail against. It makes zero sense that black people, including this organization, 
is railing against marriage as if we marry at high rates. It makes sense if you're mad at the culture of marriage, if you see so many of it and you wanted to counter culture that. But it doesn't make sense when you have low marriage rates, high broken home rates, high crime rates, high rates of all forms of dysfunction you can get. You don't need to disrupt anything at that point. It's already disrupted. And why would you be committed? That's creepy. You're committed to disrupting. Does that not sound like an author of chaos? Does that not sound like the devil wrote this? And I'm someone who believes in a God, and I also believe there are forces that are opposite to God. It looks like Satan wrote this stuff. When you say, we are committed to disrupting the West. This is how it sounds. We are committed to disrupting the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement. They probably have a sadistic voice like that. Maybe a serpent sound to it. Because how does that sound right at all? This article, it's from The Atlantic, and it was written by David Brooks. It's entitled, The Nuclear Family Was a Mistake. And real quick, why did they have to use this photo of a black family? Of all people, why us in this case, and then the rhetoric? I noticed stuff like that, and I really don't like the subconscious optics of that. However, if you go throughout the article, it talks about different family forms, not just the nuclear family format and why the nuclear family format as compared to larger groups or even alternative family groups should not be the way we see ourselves. It's trying to make the case that the Black Lives Matter organization is trying to make. It even goes into the village concept. Indirect response to the article, The Nuclear Family Was a Mistake by David Brooks, comes this article entitled, The Nuclear Family is Still Indispensable. It's written by W. Bradford Wilcox and Hal Boyd. And when you read the writing in its entirety, it makes the case for why, as much as we want alternative family forms, Marriage is actually the most stable format for offspring. And so I'm going to read a few tidbits from The Nuclear Family is Still Indispensable. And I'm pretty sure W. Bradford Wilcox and Hal Boyd, they understand what they're talking about. I'm sure David Brooks as well. And I don't think that David Brooks is anti-family. But I believe that we would be derailing the conversation if we only believe that the nuclear family can be replaced. If you want to see the nuclear family in tandem to extended family, that's great, but you can never replace the nuclear family. And I will show you that via these tidbits. But W. Bradford Wilcox, he's a professor of sociology, a senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies, a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Hal Boyd is an associate professor of family law and policy. So I'm pretty sure these guys know what they are delving into just in case people want to make the case saying that the nuclear family can be disposed. Considering that they said, look, no, 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 it is still indispensable. That would throw the conversation of what Black Lives Matter has to say out the water. Now, if they want to aspire to what David Brooks was idealizing, and even that's in a more nuanced sense, then maybe they can agree with his sentiment. But look at our collective. We don't have to look far when it comes to what's chaotically infesting us. So if we are thinking of any other family structure, considering we're not creating high rates of family structures, we would be delusional.
Suffice to say that Black Lives Matter family concept, which they say should be a replacement to the Western prescribed nuclear family structure, suffice to say that it aligns directly to what David Brooks, in his article, The Nuclear Family Was a Mistake, entitles the forged family concept. So let's look at what he says is forged families. Forged families, according to David Brooks, are single parents, single adults, and others coming together to support one another and children. And in this is the filling of the vacuum that was created by the breakdown of the nuclear family. If you would like, you can read the article in its entirety, but I want to share with you a few paragraphs that have stuck with me and that I believe disprove this, whatever this concept is of the village of extended families as somehow being a replacement. So I'm going to share those parts of the article as well as my views in response. Yet the search for alternate forms of family has two major flaws. First, there's evidence indicating that the nuclear family is, in fact, recovering. Second, a nuclear family headed by two loving married parents remains the most stable and safest environment for raising children. Think of these three sentiments. You have the word recovering. You have the words stable and safest. And this with reference to the nuclear family. That the nuclear family is both recovering and is the safest and most stable form of raising children. Why would an organization that is apparently for us be against recovering us, stabilizing us, and making us feel safe? Because you are against all of that if you're against the nuclear family. Let's take a look at other aspects of this dialogue. Since 2014, the share of kids in intact families has begun to climb, reversing a decades-long trend in the opposite direction. And as Brooks noted, citing research that one of us conducted at the University of Virginia, the nuclear family headed by married parents remains a personal ideal even among men and women who harbor no moral objections to alternative family structures. I would think that if the number of nuclear families is beginning to rise. We should celebrate this. We should realize that we don't want the trend, and clearly it says reversing a decades-long trend in the opposite direction. We don't want the opposite direction. What Black Lives Matter is claiming is that they want to break down the nuclear family as if we haven't experienced, as this article says, a decades-long trend in that brokenness. So you cannot try to usurp what already isn't. We need more nuclear families for that. And the fact that the nuclear family remains a personal ideal, that's a beautiful thing. I'm glad so many people believe that once they get to a certain point in their lives, they want to get married. They want to create families. That's so noble. That's so pure. And that should be celebrated. If there is this anti-marriage dialogue, what is the overlord to that? What is guiding that dialogue? Who is scripting that particular anti-marriage rhetoric? It cannot be something wholesome and pure. It is likely not something that has righteous intentions for us. And that's very sad to say. Because I would want to believe that our lives matter, which they do, but our families matter as well. So the irony is, you will make the sentiment that our lives matter, but you don't want our families. What about the feelings of these people who harbor no moral objections to alternative family structures, but they just want the nuclear family, not villages, not extended families, but actual married households. What's wrong with them desiring that? And I don't want to 
bash Black Lives Matter as if it is so appalling that they would think this way. We're talking about my demographic here, which is incredibly anti-marriage. But we have to undo whatever that programming is that would make us think that the broken home model is okay. Maybe it's a trauma response. Maybe people are so hurt they can't think otherwise. But we have to undo that pain and begin to realize the beauty of what a real world could look like if we were more united, more married, high rates of nuclear families. We need to aspire to that world, not the broken home world. Because our reality is a nightmare. It's not something to celebrate. But Americans should not presume that society can successfully replace families headed by married parents with models oriented more around kith and kin. Caution is especially warranted as extended families and communities struggle to foster upward mobility or to raise the next generation successfully in circumstances where the family once anchored by marriage has broken down in their midst. The fact that they say caution is especially warranted because of the toll that communities and extended families will face due to their own individual struggles tells me that it is unrealistic to put the burden on others who likely are in the broken home situation themselves. They also have to deal with the limited resources. They have to deal with the mental trauma. They have to deal with the brokenness. And that's why I believe that in a collective where there is all this brokenness, every generation has to rebuild from that broken foundation. Rather than having the foundation built and then the next generation has their own dialogue of empowerment and so on and so forth with time, we still have to have conversations that are really rudimentary, really limited in their range. I like that we should have these conversations. I think it is very important, but we're on the basic level trying to figure out the beauty of the family. And I'm glad that we're trying to figure it out, but building from that foundation is not going to be guaranteed if we do not make this the new normal. If we do not make this the new normal, generations to come, they will still be talking about the breakdown of the black family. So you cannot expect extended families and communities plagued by extreme brokenness to somehow being the answer to the breakdown of the black family. They're just extending that brokenness for time being. And he says, they struggle to foster upward mobility. So what makes us think that we have to put faith in something that cannot help us rise? If they cannot raise the next generation successfully in circumstances because of the brokenness of marriage and the family, then we cannot put faith in anything but the family. It turns out that the relationship between nuclear families and larger communities is more symbiotic than substitutionary, more interdependent than interchangeable. Whatever the merits of extended or other non-nuclear forms of family life, research has yet to show that they are entirely equipped to shoulder the unique role of a child's two parents. So it says that the relationship between nuclear families and larger communities is more... what? More symbiotic than substitutionary. More interdependent than interchangeable. So because the relationship between nuclear families and larger communities is more of a symbiotic relationship, it would be mutually beneficial for both parties to find their strengths and to insist on that working together, whatever their weaknesses is, someone else can fulfill, but they can't substitute it. They can only have relationships where strength and weaknesses alongside of each other 
is working together for the greater good. They can be interdependent so that we need each other as as families, we need each other as individuals. We are an interdependent species, but we cannot interchange our role and associate interdependence with interchangeability. That would contradict interdependence if we could somehow replace each other. That would contradict the symbiotic nature of our humanity if we could substitute each other. And I believe that's the concept that God was talking about when he talked about Eve and Adam and the fact that marriages were to be like that. They were to be created because, simply put, God said it wasn't good for a person to be alone. And he wanted to make a suitable helper. So that suitable helper concept, you could even reverberate that from the nuclear family being a singular unit and then the larger community being that suitable helper. But the suitable helper isn't the person that you're helping. And so the community isn't the family, but it is a reverberation alongside of that family. And the beauty of it is you wouldn't want to get rid of the family in that model. If we had communities and we were all working together within the function of community, you wouldn't want to get rid of the nuclear family in the model where you had intact communities because that would collapse the community itself. We need families because, like the scripture says, it's not good to be alone. So people want that person that they can spend their lives with and then the joy that families come with. We need to replenish this earth, like the scripture says, being fruitful and multiplying, but it's specific to marriage when it states this. We're not fruitful if we're multiplying in broken homes. We're not fruitful if we're multiplying at all. You have to multiply in context with your spouse. And so the issue here is we're trying to, if you're ridding the nuclear family, you're ridding marriage. If you're ridding marriage, you're promoting reckless breeding habits. You're promoting breeding outside of marriage. But why do we have a duty to breeding, but not a duty to family? Why do we have a duty to having kids out of wedlock, as if that's somehow aspirational, it's helping the world, and not a duty to providing those children a righteous nesting space? Sarah McClanahan of Princeton University and Gary Sandifer of the University of Wisconsin have found that the average child raised by a mother and grandmother is doing about the same as the average child raised by a single mother on outcomes such as dropping out of high school or having a teen birth. And in the absence of both parents, children raised by their extended kin, such as an aunt or uncle, are significantly more likely to have, in the words of one study, higher levels of internalizing problems, including loneliness and sadness, compared to their peers raised by married parents. As for other emerging forms of family, such as forged families, there are well-founded reasons for skepticism about the role unrelated adults might play in raising a child. Over the years, study after study has detailed the many possible downsides to introducing unrelated adults, especially men, into children's lives without the presence of those children's married parents. This is because, sadly, adults who are unrelated to children are much more likely to abuse or neglect them than their own parents are. One federal report found that children living in a household with an unrelated adult were about nine times more likely to be physically, sexually, or emotionally abused than children raised in an intact nuclear family. All this is to say that, for kids, it matters if all the pairs of arms raising them include, first and foremost, those of their own parents. The positive effects of stable marriage and stable nuclear families also spill over. Neighborhoods, towns, and cities are more likely to flourish when they are sustained by lots of married households. The work of the Harvard sociologist Robert Sampson tells us that neighborhoods with many two-parent families are much safer. In his own words, family structure is one of the strongest, if not the strongest, predictors of variations in urban violence across cities in the United States. His Harvard colleagues, the economists Raj Chetty and Nathaniel Hendren, have drawn similar conclusions about the relationship between the health of the American dream and the presence of two-parent families in a community. Working with a team of scholars, 
they found that black boys are more likely to achieve upward economic mobility if there are more black fathers in a neighborhood, and more married couples, as well. Children raised in communities with high percentages of single mothers are less likely to move up. In other words, it takes a village, but of married people, to raise the odds that a poor child will have a shot at the American dream. To be sure, the isolated nuclear family detached from all social support is simply not workable for most people. Married couples raising children, as well as other family forms, are more likely to thrive when they are embedded in strong networks of friends, family, community, and religious congregations. Likewise, communities are stronger and safer when they include lots of committed married couples. It's good news, then, that the share of children being raised by their own married parents is on the rise. Extended kin can, and sometimes must, play a greater role in meeting children's needs. But as any parent knows, when it comes to an inconsolable child, even a dozen pairs of arms from the village don't quite compare to the warm and safe embrace of mom or dad. W. Bradford Wilcox, a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia, is senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies and a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Hal Boyd is an associate professor of family law and policy at Brigham Young University's School of Family Life and a fellow of the Wheatley Institution. I'm going to go back to the page about the 13 guiding principles, and I just wanted to share just other views of this. So they state in point number eight, we are guided by the fact all black lives matter. No, you're not, because if you were guided by that fact, you would promote the, the black family. You wouldn't want to disrupt it. You would want it to continue. So do black families matter? in nuclear families or do they only matter in this village extended families concept another contradicting element is when they say let's go to point 13 we are committed to building a black women affirming space free from sexism misogyny and male-centeredness but if you dismantle the family if you disrupt the nuclear family, that means she's going to have to fulfill the role of everyone in that family that would have been the leader. So the mother and the father role rather than just fulfilling the mother role. And that is pretty sexist because she has to be the one to create these extended families and villages. Somebody has to birth that. And so more than likely it's going to be her and she's going to birth it and then she's going to raise it and she's going to be the only parent around to fulfill that because once again nowhere in this 13 guiding principles dialogue did they bring up men that's pretty strange and another thing is when you go to the section entitled black families you'll notice that they only talk about mothers and how is a black family just a mother and her children that's a broken home that's not necessarily a family structure. That's not structured at all. And what's sick is in that they say dismantling the patriarchal practice that requires mothers to work double shifts. And it's talking about double shift in a, in a double life sense. So in other words, someone who in one breath is being a worker and in another breath is being pro their community. So that's what they mean by double shifts. But what if you wanted to use that term literally speaking? It would be accurate because when you get rid of the nuclear family, she has to work overtime to be the provision, to be the whatever role that mothers play in the family structure and the father's role because he's not there. So you are making her do all the work and that doesn't sound like someone who is committed to building an affirming space for black women that sounds like someone who wants black women to do everything and it's funny how they'll say 
Black women affirming space free from sexism, misogyny, and male-centeredness, and yet they never center the male in any of these discussions, which is ironically centering the man, because you are ironically, by not bringing him up, absolving him of any responsibility. And the fact that you're absolving him of responsibility is male-centered. The woman you see on the screen, she wrote this article entitled Black Families Matter. And I have to agree with her. Being that she looks white, I'm presuming understands what marriage means, what family means. More than likely, she grew up in a two-parent nuclear family. And it's benefiting her collective to have so many families. We can learn from this that it would only benefit us if we increase the amount of two parent, not one parent households in broken homes, but had this anthem that said black families matter and began to increase that. This woman who stated that our families matter she has more than likely a nuclear family of her own, and she didn't have to say this. She did not have to agree with this sentiment, but I'm so glad that there are people in this world who commentate in favor of the black family, in favor of families. So this is my belief, black families matter. And I'm pro-marriage and the nuclear family. My name is Gershley Karen Pierre. Stay tuned for more.